Mary Benjamin, 1934. Born in Mammal, Lithuania? That's right. Tell me what was it like growing up and moving to the United States? We left Lithuania because of what was coming, and that was the Holocaust. Oh. And as a Jew in Lithuania, especially in Mamo, which was originally part of East Prussia, it was one of the first places that the Nazis took over. So we left in 37 to New York City, where my grandparents had gotten to uh, the year before. We had a nice trip over there. I mean, we went on the Queen Mary, and uh, oh, wow. it was uh, whatever I can remember about it. The only thing I remember, the elevators, believe it or not. <laughs> and grew up in uh, Brooklyn. Brooklyn was the first place we lived. And I lived there until age seven, and then we moved into Manhattan. And that's where I lived until I finished college and uh, went into service and eventually came back and then left. So uh, So tell me about your grandparents. When they moved to New York City, do you recall what they did at, for a living? I don't ever remember my grandfather working. And yet he always had money. He had come over in uh, the 20s. And had a farm in New Jersey mm -hmm. and didn't like it here wow. and went back to Europe. So I don't know, I know in Europe he had properties, uh, there were settlements made by the Russian government later on because they confiscated these mm -hmm. properties after the war. But he, uh, he was retired. He was retired, but we always lived in close proximity, so uh, both my grandfather and grandmother were very close to me. That's great. Um, as so, a young child. So as a young child in New York City, tell me about what it was like growing up in New York City. Oh, it was very nice. We lived uh, in a great spot on the Upper West Side, Manhattan. Mm -hmm. Central Park was my playground. And a lot of people, when they think of you growing up in New York City and the concrete and all that, they think it's a hardship situation when actually Central Park was Disney World before it was a <laughs> Disney World. You know, you see what I mean? Yeah. Uh, we play in the park. We, we found caves that people never knew about existed. You know. We even skated on the lake if it froze over once in a while. Uh, it was, it was a good, we played on the street, you know, street games. So. Well, what do you remember about school, high school? What do you remember about going to high school? Well, I went to a very special high school. I, I peaked early, mentally. And uh, I went to the Bronx High School of Science, which is, at that time, certainly was the most prestigious high school in the city public school. Uh, that high school right now I think has over eight Nobel Prize winners who attended it. Wow. And uh, you had to be tested for it. And you went to school with people of that type, you know, mm -hmm. so uh, it was, at that time, it was a predominantly Jewish high school. So where did you uh, attend college? Uh, stayed in the city and went to Brooklyn College, which is part of the city college system. And here again, it was a very fine liberal arts college, small school, 7,000. And uh, what exactly did you study? Well, that was a problem because I really didn't know what to study. And I wasn't a great student. I felt I needed college, and at the time, Korean draft was on, and I couldn't see myself being drafted. So by going to college, I delayed that, and they had an Air Force ROTC program. And that appealed to me, appealed to me a lot. And that ended up being my motivation. I finally majored in psychology. But I got my commission in the Air Force when I graduated, and I was thinking seriously of making it a career. And uh, I did well in school, in the program, 
And uh, went on and when I graduated, uh, got married a month later and a month after that went in the service. Uh, let's talk about how you met your uh, wife. Yeah, uh, Naomi, that was her name. Uh, she was two years behind me in school. So I met her about a year and a half before I graduated. And uh, we got married about a month after I graduated, you know. And, Did you uh, have any children? Uh, yeah, my three boys are with my first wife. I have three sons. Okay, now let's talk about when you went off to the Air Force. Tell me about that whole experience, what you do, what was your mission, where you stationed? Well, it's a great experience, totally. Uh, as a Air Force uh, ROTC lieutenant, everybody goes to Lackland Air Force Base, which is in San Antonio, for like f four weeks a month of in-processing orientation. Uh, from there, I became a navigator. I went to navigation school at uh, Ellington Air Force Base, which was just south of Houston. So great, you're in the city and you had all the amenities of being in a big city. And that was a 13-month program then. That was a long school. So I got my navigator wings there. From there, the next assignment was to Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi, Mississippi, to go to electronic warfare school. So that was six months, seven months. And then finally, after Keesler, and that's where our first child was born in Mississippi, went to Japan, to Yokota Air Force Base. And I was in the 11th Tactical Reconnaissance Squadron. We flew a two-engine jet called the RB-66. It was a twin-engine jet. Top speed 0.9 Mach. Ceiling of maybe 48, 49,000 feet. And it was an excellent reconnaissance aircraft. And it was used for different recon missions, weather, photo, and I was in the electronic version. And uh, that was exciting work for, quote, peacetime because we flew off of the uh, coast of Russia in the Far East. We flew off of Vietnam before there was an act of Vietnam. Uh, we still flew Korea, even though that conflict was theoretically over with. And in 1958, there was a very serious uh, conflict going on that a lot of people in the States didn't realize how strongly we were committed to backing Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalist Chinese versus the communist mainland. And the uh, communists were threatening to invade some of the nationalist possessions. So we would fly recon through the Straits of Formosa. Well, the Straits of Formosa uh, are the Straits of Taiwan that was called Formosa earlier. And, and if they were going to invade, we were committed to Chiang Kai-shek in the defense of uh, that territory. So as I say, that was exciting. There were a couple little hazardous things that came up. But in general, uh, you felt like you were doing something worthwhile, you know. Was there any scary event off the coast of Formosa? Yeah, and then there was one off of Vladivostok also. International laws which require an aircraft to uh, fly so many miles off of the coast of a foreign country. But when we would fly and patrol Russia in the Pacific, in Vladivostok, their big city there, they would send up a couple of MiGs to kind of give you an escort. And they would wait for you to make a wrong move. And if you penetrated that 12-mile area, 
they could shoot you down. But when it happened to me for the first time, and I could look out, and he was so close, I could see the Russian pilot. Of course, they had oxygen and his helmet on. But I could wave at him, you know? And I did wave. I never knew how I would react to an exciting situation. I never knew if I would freeze up or I, you know. I tend to go hyper, I think, with exhilaration when that happens, because it happened to me again in, when we flew through Taiwan Straits. And what happened there, and that was like 2, 3 a.m. in the morning, you have a mission where you're working for a certain period of time. And we were almost through when our pilot announced, we have two engine jet that our right engine was creating a problem and he was forced, he was shutting it down. He said, but we can go on the one engine as long as there are no other problems, but go through your safety you know, measures, which means you're in an ejection seat to get out of the airplane. And you know, you kick your feet into the, holds your ankles and you have a visor you're supposed to pull down and then you yank the seat. So I'm going through this mentally, you know. Now I keep in mind this is uh, the end of January, the water's cold down there. And the pilot says, as soon as we're through with our mission, I'll go mayday. I don't want to break radio silence until we're through with the mission. And by going mayday, he creates an effect that we're all, always monitored by ground control radar. So if you're in a mayday SOS situation, you flip the switch, I guess, and when the signal bounces off of you, it's coded SOS. And then he talks to you anyway. But within no time, there were two, they were called SA-16s, uh, two rescue planes. And actually, they can even land in the water. But there was moonlight, so you could see them. Within maybe 15 minutes, these planes showed up. And what they were there for was if you went down, they would drop big rafts. Because we had little rafts. And uh, in tough seas, it might be tough to just be in a little raft. Whereas if they're around, they drop a real big one, your chances of surviving a lot stronger. But fortunately, fortunately, nothing happened. The one engine worked, you know. And we landed at Clark in the Philippines. And uh, we're there for four weeks until they figured out what to do with the engine. They discovered that had he tried to restart, it would have blown up and maybe taken the wing with it. So he did the right thing, you know, by leaving it alone. And we landed. And it ended up where we had a, uh, a winter vacation. The Philippines in February is beautiful. <laughs> Best time of the year to go. I had to make the decision then whether to stay or not, you know. And I look back at it and I say, maybe I should have stayed, you know. <laughs> Well, how long were you in the service? Three years. Three years? Yeah. And then uh, what did you do after that? Well, when I got home, I had one child. I didn't know what I was going to do. <laughs> but I had saved money. We had saved money. So we didn't rush into it. But to find affordable living, we went to Brooklyn. Went to Brooklyn to live rather than Manhattan. Lived near my in-laws. And I answered a name in the New York Times, and it said, Officer Vets Preferred. So it was perfect. Come on here, I'm first lieutenant, you know. And uh, it was for Macy's, New York. And I never thought of retailing as a career. But people told me, if you're interested in retailing, getting into the Macy's program was like, say, getting into Harvard if you're talking universities. And by the time they're through testing you and interviewing, they offered me a job. So I took it. Long hours for very little pay. And very political, too. So I was there for about a year and a half. And I had an incident with someone there who gave me my 
quote, fitness report. And I was on the verge of being fired when one of the other people there wanted to give me a promotion because he liked what I had done. So I was ready to stay and then budget created a problem. So anyway, they let me resign, you know, with severance. And I was fortunate at that time, a job became available in the wholesale women's industry, which of course in New York's a big business. So I went to work uh, for a ladies' dress manufacturer. And uh, directly, indirectly, I stayed with that company from 60 to 75. And in 75, hooked up with a California company. And I stayed with them to uh, 2001. Uh, the good thing about it is that both my wife and I realized we could live anywhere based on our military service. You know, they're good people wherever you go. And we realized there would be better and easier places to raise family than New York City. So we kept our eyes open, you know, for that opportunity and that came along in uh, 1963. And we moved to Dallas that 4th of July weekend. And I've been here ever since. And let's talk about how you met Diane. Well, let me just say I was married to my first wife for 25 years. Uh, she passed away. I was single for five years. I thought I'd never be able to replace somebody like I was at a wedding, and a friend of mine who had also been widowed had just gotten married and introduced me to his new wife. <laughs> So we talked and talked, and uh, she said before we left that evening, she said, would you mind if I called you with a list of women who I think would love to meet you? <laughs> I said, well, it's been in a singles club. You know, that's great. So, uh, yeah, Rebecca Greenblatt, Becky Greenblatt, uh, called me that Monday morning with a list. And Diane was the only one on the list who I knew who she was, etc. So I put her on the bottom of the list. <laughs> and over, a, I don't know how long it took me to go through the other five names on the list. I met them, spoke with them, semi-dated. And uh, she calls me back, Becky calls me back and says, are you ready for another list? I said, yeah, I'm ready. you called everyone? I, I can't lie to people, you know. <laughs> I said, well, everybody, but Diane. So she got a caller. I said, all right, all right. I'll call it, then I'll call you for the list. But see, I knew Diane, I knew who she was. Beautiful. Gorgeous. A little on the tall side, but that never, <laughs> that, that never bothered me, though. But she had four sons, I had three, and she had been married to a rabbi. Now, I'm proud of my Judaism, but I'm not that observant. So I didn't know how that would work out. So I decided, all right, I'll call her on the Sabbath. She's probably in synagogue, and I can tell Becky I called and get a new list, right? <laughs> she answered the phone. And we went out to, uh, oh gosh, that restaurant is closed now, on Walnut and Greenville. But anyway, we had supper there, and they closed the place on us, you know. <laughs> and that was that. And then I'd say within a year, we were married. And we're now married 27 years. So you have a total of seven sons, yeah. three of your own and uh, four stepsons. Yeah, step four terrific. Uh, and then you said 12 grandchildren? Yeah. So what advice would you want to leave with your grandchildren? Uh, honesty, sense of duty, doing the right thing rather than the easy thing. What I've told them as adults, and I still believe it, is that the important thing in their lives is their relationship with their spouses. They live with their spouses and their children. 
it's a full time thing. Once they're gone from my home, you know, it's once in a while. So I know that parents can get in the way, you know, of a happy marriage at times. And they're all good kids. They're all good kids, and uh, I think they live productive lives. Tell me about your involvement in the Jewish community. In New York, I wasn't very involved, other than attending a synagogue that my parents belonged to. New York being Jewish is a very easy thing. You know, the whole place is Jewish. You move to Dallas, or you go to a Biloxi, or you go to a San Antonio, you're definitely a minority. And the association, to me, was important in retaining your identity and, and growing with it. So when we moved here, we heard that they had started a, uh, a day school, parochial school, Jewish parochial school, a Keep Academy. And uh, we sent our child there, and that's a key to trivia. Andy Benjamin was the first graduate ever of that school and became involved. They needed young parents on the board there, so I got involved there. We wanted a uh, little scouting program for the Jewish kids that wouldn't conflict with keeping Sabbath. So I was one of a couple of the other parents. Uh, I started a Cub Scout pack for those kids and then joined my synagogue, but I traveled a lot. My, my career, I was sales rep, sales manager, did a lot of traveling, went to a lot of places, weekends, so I couldn't really belong to anything and feel as if I'm doing something. Not that I didn't want to. But uh, I would say when I retired, uh, I got on the board of directors of my synagogue. I volunteered to become the chairman of the cemeteries there. So i very involved in that. And then my wife enlisted me in the Jewish war veterans to get me out of the house. I've served as our post commander on three occasions. I've been the department commander. I'm on the National Executive Committee. And uh, I've just been promoted into the coordinating committee of the national organization, which is a big step. I'm sorry I didn't get involved in it earlier. I'd have higher aspirations. But uh, it's something that I feel is an extremely worthwhile organization. It's the oldest veterans organization in the country, older than the Legion, older than the VFW. It started in 1895 by uh, Civil War veterans to uh, fight the, uh, well, to fight anti-Semitism. The assertion made by anti-Semites that Jews did not fight for their country. And Jews have been in every war in this country since the since Peter Stuyvesant days. So uh, it's a good program. I think Dallas is a great community and it's a great place to live. And I think there are a lot of people in our community who are involved in the community. Right. Very different from New York, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Thank you for sharing all of your yeah. all of your stories. Good. Thanks. You did great. Thanks for having me.